with that said, we're going to be looking today at Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to the end of the chapter to verse uh, 39. So I'll begin reading in Romans 8 at verse 28, and I'll read to verse 30, and we'll get into our study, developing an introduction, uh, bringing a, a review of some of the things we've seen here in the 8th chapter, and then moving through the chapter. So beginning at verse 28, reading to verse 30, Paul writes, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now, as we've been going through chapter 8, remember with me that Paul had just written that nature... Christians and the Holy Spirit all groan. In verse 22, he had said, nature groans for the revelation of the sons of God. In verse 23, he had said, Christians groan as we wait for redemption to be completed. And in verse 26, he had said, the Holy Spirit groans as he makes intercession on our behalf. And so because of this, Paul has, is giving encouragement. And he's giving an encouragement. We'll see this in a moment, he's giving encouragement to believers. In other words, no matter what they're enduring, no matter what they will endure, God is working with them. And no matter how it may appear, God is in and remains in total control. Now, he's already been alluding to troubles in the believer's life, including his self, his own life. He had said in chapter 8, verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so he spoke concerning troubles, afflictions, problems, sufferings and persecutions and afflictions, he's saying, are part of the walk that we have with the Lord. So believers, including himself, are not excluded from these kinds of things. Peter says it like this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, when the apostle Peter was writing, he said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. So when he said, do not think it's strange, that word strange speaks of being startled. Don't be startled by. So don't think it to be strange concerning the fiery trial that is uh, trying you as though some strange, he used the word strange again, but this time it meant unusual. So don't think it's strange. Don't be startled concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange or some unusual thing happened to you. In other words, trials, afflictions, persecutions, difficulties are just part of being alive. It's just part of being a believer. It's just part of life itself. You see, when enduring those kinds of things, it is easy to lose hope. That's why he said that believers are to remain faithful, trusting in the Lord. And so as he's been developing this, Paul is now giving a deeper word of encouragement, and he does so in verse 28. He begins there, and this is what he says. Again, verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. In spite of how it may appear at the moment, you can know one thing, God is at work. You know, there are advantages to being a Christian for a long time. I've been a Christian for a while now, a long time, comparatively. I've been a Christian since 1970. I'm going on 53 years, 53 years of walking with the Lord. And you know, that, that, there's advantage to that. There's an advantage to growing older in Christ, mellowing out in Jesus, if you will. And I've shared this. I was sharing this recently with... Uh, with a younger member of the body of Christ here. I was sharing that just, this re just recently. And I said just that. I said there's a good thing. Uh, getting older is a good thing. And I said let me tell you why. Because when you're younger as I have been. You think that things have to change right now. Or they never will. I said the fact of the matter is. Is that you give it time. And everything works out for the good. You have to give it time. I think that sometimes we can be anxious. We want things done now. We want changes now. We want to be delivered now. And sometimes the work that God is doing in us is going to take a little bit of time. 
And so it's better to remain still awaiting the Lord to do his work than it is to be moving around and hindering it. When I was 14, I got my appendix removed. I was there laying on that operating table. They had given me some, uh, you know, uh, anesthesia. And as I was laying there, I still remember very vividly all these years later how the doctor who was above, right here above me um, said scalpel. And I awakened when he said scalpel. And I, I saw the nurse hand him the scalpel and I saw him plunge it in my side. Uh, yeah. Uh, I fainted. I mean, I, I didn't stay awake the second I saw him plunge it. Now, one of the things I learned through that is you never move during an operation, right? You don't move during an operation. But we like to move when the Holy Spirit operates on us. When the Lord brings out his scalpel to remove something that's going to kill us or is dangerous to us, we like to move all over, dodging it. It's, I learned a long time ago, remain still while the surgeon does his work. Remain still. Be still and know that I am God. Allow God to do his work. All things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. They do work together, and Paul is speaking concerning those things. And so in spite of how it may appear at the moment, you know one thing. Now, when he says we know that all things, that word know, again, I did a little a little more um, looking at the Greek, the original language. I want to get more precise uh, understanding. That word know says, it, it is translated that we can have absolute certainty. You can know with absolute certainty. You can know one thing. God is in control. He is saying God causes everything that we experience to produce good results in our lives. It's hard to believe sometimes, isn't it? But it's true. He allows everything we experience to ultimately produce good. Now, he had just written in verse 26 that we don't always know how to pray. But in spite of this, we can know that all things are working together for good. Now, when he says all things work together for good, he's pointing to life in general. He's not giving us permission to go out and sin expecting good to be the result. He isn't saying that willful sinning will result in good. He is saying that in our lives, as we live for the Lord, that he cares for us. And even when things are working against us, he is working on our behalf. You see, God would never permit evil if he could not bring good out of it. So whatever we encounter, God can redeem. In Psalm 46, verses 1 and 2, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. We will not fear. That's something to remember, isn't it? Because I believe that the enemy uses fear to capture people and manipulate people constantly. We've gone through a season of that, haven't we? with the COVID thing and all the false reporting and the various things that kept us confused and controlled. That's what happened. There was a very real virus. But what was being said wasn't accurate, and we discovered that over time. And so you can't be controlled by fear. All things do work together. Now, when he says all things work together, I looked that up. But what does work together it's a, it's a word that uh, we, are, we are familiar with, uh, synergy, synergize. It, it speaks of cooperation. So working together is synergy. He's saying all things combine to produce good. Now, this is not good produced by the events alone. The events occur, but the Lord causes them to bring about good. There's an example, and I wrote this down because I want to read this to make sure that I don't belabor this. So I'll just read it. An example of this is found in the book of Genesis in reference to Joseph, who was the son of Jacob. Joseph was born of Jacob and Rachel. He was Jacob's favorite, causing his brothers to become jealous of him. 
Now he had two dreams, and after having those dreams and sharing them with the family, his brothers, out of hatred, had sold him into slavery, and he was taken to Egypt. Well, in Egypt, he was sold to a eunuch named Potiphar. Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce Joseph, and Joseph was imprisoned falsely. While imprisoned, he had the opportunity of interpreting two dreams, one for a butler, the other for the baker. Two years later, he was released from prison. He was made Pharaoh's prime minister. While he was in that office, he was re reunited with his brothers. And when he revealed himself to his brothers, they became afraid because they had sold him and they thought that he would take revenge on them. We all know that story. But Genesis chapter 50, verses 18 through 20 says it like this. His brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, this is beautiful, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. He was falsely imprisoned, spent 13 years in prison from the time he was 17 till he was 30 years of age. He was elevated to a position of authority. Ultimately, the brothers who sold him into slavery came needing help. He could have taken revenge, but he didn't because he had an eternal framework. He said, you meant it for evil, but God intended it for good. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Because there are times in our lives, there are circumstances we will endure, things that occur that we could wonder, how could we ever see any good come out of this? But all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Remember that. You may need to know that on the way home tonight. You may need to know that tomorrow or next week. Just remember that. All things work together. What they intended for evil, God intended for good. So he says all things work together for good. All things working together can produce blessings. Why? Well, they can refine us. And they also cause us to grow in our understanding of God's mercy. We learn the ways of the Lord as we go through things. And sometimes those lessons that we learn, well, they do take some time. And so we're there crying out to the Lord. I don't know how to pray, God. I'm making groanings. The Spirit is interceding. I don't know what to expect. And God says, all things will work together for good if you love me. So they work together and they give us insight into God's goodness. They bring us into a much clearer perspective and understanding. It's like what Job said in chapter 42, verses 5 and 6, when he had said, I, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. When you look at Job, you see that Job is in chapter 1, chapter 2, he is spoken of as being a righteous man, a very, very righteous man. And yet this is a man that is a picture of walking by faith and not by sight. I've heard of you with the hearing of my ear. And out of what I knew of you and had learned of you, I was obedient too. But now I see you with the seeing of my eye. Now I see what you really are like in the midst of all the sufferings and losses that Job went through. He says, I've discovered that you're good. And I didn't realize that until I went through affliction. Until I went through the things that I've gone through. And so all things are working together for good to those, notice, who love God. So in life, there are basically two categories of people, those who love God and those who don't. You need to know that there isn't a place of neutrality. Either you're for him or you're against him. There are people who think that they can be kind of spiritual Switzerland's neutral, and, and you can't be. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 12, verse 30. He said, he who is not with me is against me. He who gathers not with me scatters abroad. He didn't leave any gap. He said, either you are or you're not. Like a man could say to a woman, will say, you're not a little pregnant. Either you are or you're not. But if a man does say that to a woman, you better be sure she is. Because <laughs> I remember... <laughs> When our church was very young, I was standing in the back and people were filing out and I used to say, hi, how are you? And this and that. And here comes a woman I knew, kind of, and I never did it before, I promise. I never have done it again. <laughs> but I patted her tummy. 
yeah, I did. And I said, and when are you due? <laughs> I'm not pregnant. Uh, anyway, <laughs> see, never saw her again. Yeah, so be careful. But with that said, we better get back to the, <laughs> to the Bible study. To those who love God, how do we know we love him? How can you know this? Love isn't simply an emotion. We know that love is a decision of the will. Love isn't based on how I'm feeling at the moment. Love is based on a variety of things, but it's usually my, it's a decision. You make the decision to love, and then you act out those things that you've decided to do. So how can I know? How can I know that I have love for God? Let me give you a few things. One, how do I know that I love God? One is I'm obedient to him. I'm obedient to him. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. And so in 1 John 5, verse 3, John said, this is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. They're not grievous. They're not hard to bear. When you're in love, love makes things light. When you love the Lord, you are obedient to him. Another thing, second thing is, you desire close fellowship with him. It's like what it says in Psalm 63, verse 1. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there's no water. So I long for you. I have a relationship with you. I have fellowship with you. I love you. I want to obey you. And I long for you. I enjoy my fellowship with you. A third thing is, we love his word. Like it says in Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. I love your word. I long for it. I thirst for it. I love fellowship with you, and I love your word. A fourth thing is, is we love people. Ah. It's easy to love those who love you, isn't it? It really is. It's difficult to show love to those who mock you, some of you were, how many of you, may I ask this before I give this, uh, how many of you were in first service this time, just if you were here, would you raise your hand so I kind of know, okay, first service, uh, I'm assuming that others, if you came to church, went to second service, and if you didn't come to church, <laughs> but anyway, we had people who were out there who were kind of harassing, you know, so we went, I went out in between first and second, and I spoke to them, and uh, he put me on his, uh, his little uh, feed and uh, just blurred out, I guess, the things I was telling him. And I was telling Second Service that I, that I went and shared the gospel with him. I went and spoke to him. And we had people from our church, some of the guys who came and gave him water because it was hot, so he drank. That's what you do. It, 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 you know, if you, and we'll see this in, in Romans, but if you're, if, you're, if you're enemy, and he's an enemy to us apparently, is thirsty, you give him something to drink. It's hot. You know, here, here's some water, drink. I hope you drown on it. But <laughs> we love you as we're giving it to you. <laughs> Do you love people? Do you love people? Do you love people? Yeah, by this shall all men know you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, Jesus said. It's not... Uh, it's not where I serve, and it's how many things I do. It's do I love people? And so that's something that you pray for. I, I pray that quite, an, quite often because those are things that are evidences that you, that you love the Lord, you know. So those who love God, these are things that, that demonstrate that there's a love in their heart for him. So he says that in verse 28. He says, to those who love God, to those, he says, who are called according to his purpose, so God is the one who has called us. He, he called us by the gospel, the preaching and proclamation of, of salvation through Christ. We heard it outwardly, and we inwardly obeyed it. He called us according to his purpose. When it says according to his purpose, that speaks of his plan, his divine plan. And so he called us according to his purpose, his divine plan. So the question is, what's the divine plan? What is his purpose? Well, Verse 29, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So for 
whom he foreknew. And a foreknew can speak of prior knowledge. Obviously, that's what the word would be defined. Foreknew prior knowledge. Uh, but it doesn't speak simply of a prior knowledge because the word know can be used in, in, in reference to an intimacy. Adam knew his wife and she conceived. So they're, it, it, they're speaking of more than prior knowledge. It can be used to also describe um, an intimacy. And so God has an intimate knowledge of us. It, it, it would speak of his, his love that he has for us as his children that he's had from the beginning. Again, the, the word carries a sense of intimacy. Uh, in Amos chapter 3, verse 9, uh, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, the Lord speaks and says to the nation of Israel. In 2 Timothy 2.19, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having the seal, the Lord knows those who are his. There's an in intimacy, he has a knowledge. And so those whom he foreknew, those who he has relationship with prior and loves deeply, and then he speaks of those whom he has predestined. The word predestined speaks of appointing, determining beforehand. It speaks of marking out. And so the word predestined is looking to the end of his purpose. And what is his purpose? Verse 29, to be conformed into the image of his son. His plan for the believer is that we'll be like him. That we will be like Jesus. He's to be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 29, what is he doing? He's creating a family, a community. He's bringing about a community of people who glorify him. In Titus 2.14, Paul said, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar, a different, a unique people who are zealous for good works. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Why were you saved to praise him who called you out of darkness, out of spiritual darkness, the life that we lived without him? He saved us, and, and we are lights now in a very dark world. And he created a new community that we might glorify him. And this new community is being conformed into the image of Christ. You see, ultimately, we're going to have glorified bodies. Every day, I look forward to that more and more. Glorified body. I groan already, but not in the biblical way. I just <laughs> groan. But we're going to have bodies that are, are suitable for heaven. In Philippians 3, 20 and 21, it says our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. You see, while on earth, our lives are being transformed in heaven, we ultimately have that, that glory. On earth, we'll see this in Romans 12. Paul said it like this in verse 2. He said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And so on earth, we're being transformed because no longer will we be conformed to this age. We're being transformed by the renewing of our mind. So here on earth, that's taking place, but in heaven, that'll be completed. So in the new community, he's saying that Jesus is the firstborn, meaning when he says firstborn, he is the one who is preeminent. He is the firstborn. So it's not speaking of the birth order it's speaking of the honor. You see, Jesus is the unique son of God and has favored status. In Matthew 3.17, a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So there are those who will say, Well, Jesus is firstborn and speak of him as if he was a human being created uh, and the firstborn in terms of, uh, um, <laughs> you know, as a human being. It's a cultic way to think because Jesus Christ is God in the flesh incarnated. And so it speaks of his, his preeminence is what it's referring to. It's not speaking of the fact that he is a first, but it's speaking in terms of his honor and glory that he has as the firstborn. In Colossians 1, it says it a little more clearly in verses 15 through 20. He is the Im image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So he is the firstborn, and so he is the preeminent one. We're only adopted children into the family of God. So our purpose is to worship him. Now in verse 30 continues, and he says, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so he's speaking concerning those who have been called and all predestined, those who are called. And so those of us who have been called, it speaks of how we received Christ through hearing the word of the gospel. So he called us through the proclamation of the gospel. Again, that's one of the reasons, guys, remember this always, that it's very important for us as believers to center our attention on the proclamation of God's word. I don't know how else to say that any more plain than that. I think that today what we have is a lot of distractions even in the church, that people... People can go to uh, church services for the wrong reasons. I'll say this very quickly, if I can. Um, When I first got saved, I didn't go to church for entertainment. I didn't go to church services, Bible studies, to to do anything other than to learn about Jesus Christ. That's I figured if I'm going to live for Christ, I need to know what His Word says. That made sense to me. See, so we had an amazing thing going in, in the, when I was saved. Obviously, a movie was, it was made about that, and Greg was sharing those things. Greg Laurie, you know, about this revolution. But it was true. I, what, was, what, we, what our lives were built on was not entertainment. Our lives were built on Jesus Christ. And we went to church as young people. I was 20 years old. Went to church services, not because they had great bands, and they did, and not because they had a great... Speakers, Lonnie Frisbee and Chuck Smith, they were very, very uh, amazing communicators and, and, and all of that. But that's not why I went. I went because I wanted to know God. I, I want, now, how am I going to know God if I don't hear the Bible? How am I, how am I going to know him? And I'm telling you, and, and I say this with, with sorrow, and I guess I can say it with some authority and experience. I've been around for a while now. I can say this. Um, there are quite a number of places that may be filled with people, but they're not filled with the things of the Lord. They're, they're there for the, the exciting um, music and maybe the exciting speech and all of that happens all over. You see it on TV all the time. And what has happened is Bible studies have been turned into entertainment and churches are entertainment centers. And, and that doesn't build you up because... You can get just so hyped, you know, and so excited. Then you climb in your car and you drive home and you go back to regular life. And it's, you haven't been helped. But when you know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, when you know that and you go home and you enter back into a situation that is difficult, you can have hope because you know God's in control. That comes not through a pep talk. And that comes not through exciting worship. I thank God for, for great exhortation and, and, and spiritual worship. Of course, of course. But that's not what my life was built on. And so from the time I was 20 to where I'm at right now, it's been built on the solid rock of the word of God, which is giving me the ability to go through the times that sometimes are rough. And sometimes it's like you're, you're trying to walk on water, but the wind is blowing and the waves are, are, are crashing and I don't know what I'm, and then you say, no, all things are working together. God is going to do something marvelous through this. Just be still, know that he's God. Don't try and save yourself out of this. Let him do the work he wants, and you'll see God will move. And so he's calling us. He calls us by the word, and then he justifies us. That word justify, he declares us to be not guilty. We are not guilty. He has already he's taken it upon himself. Our sin has been paid for he's declared that we've been justified we've already seen that 
In chapter 5, he had said in verse 1, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 30, whom he justified, he also glorified. I want you to notice that, that the, what he's, he's using past tense. Uh, glorified is a past tense thing, he's saying. It, it, it's, it's this way, in God's sight. This is already done. He looks at it as something already done. I was standing in line years ago, and there were two kids in front of me. Where Marie and I were going to a movie, and, and these kids were having an argument. I just happened to be standing there. They were like 10 or 11 years old, and they were just arguing about a sports event that had taken place. And one was saying, this particular team's going to win. And the other one was saying, no, this team's going to win. And they were arguing. I mean, they were very serious. And it's kind of fun to watch a kid argue like that. And, and so as I was watching them arguing, uh, I already knew the score of the game. So I turned to one of the kids and I whispered to him and I said, bet on the Rams, they won. It was something already done. And, in our, and our lives are, are, are like a dream that's already been had. The events have already taken place in the mind of God. He's justified you. He's already, this is so heavy, I can't explain it. I don't even grip, uh, grab how deeply th deep this is. He sees us already, this is so hopeful, as glorified. The work in his sight. You love God. You're called according to his purpose. He's glorified you. It is an event in his mind that is complete. So don't live as if you've got, it's already in his sight done. Just live in that way. Give yourself a little bit of grace, I guess. God is at work. So he goes on and he says, what then, verse 31, what then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be? So Goliath and David, nine foot nine versus five foot five, maybe. Little David at that time was the average height of the average Jewish man of his day, a thousand years before Christ. Five five, they say, maybe five six. Nine foot nine, and he comes upon this giant who's challenging the armies of Israel. Who is this uncircumcised pagan? What an attitude. He's nothing. You know, just allow me to take care of him because when he approaches David, and the scripture's interesting how it says, and David ran to him. David was anxious, and he ran to him. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but he said, he says, there you are with your, with your weapons of war, you know, your sword and javelin, your spear. You've got all those things, yeah, but I come to you in the name of God, and you have defied him, and I'm going to cut your head off. Now, that's David. So what he saw was not the giant. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. What he saw was the one who gives him victory. See, so keep that in mind. Because when you face your giant obstacles, you're not coming against them in your own strength because I promise you, you'll lose. You're coming in the strength of the Lord. And if you understand that, victory is assured. If God is for us, who can be against us? What more can be said? We're conformed, we're being conformed into his image. We're called, justified, we're glorified. If God is for us, well, what's going to frustrate his plan? You see, God is the omnipotent king of the universe, and this, this king is on our side. It's like what it says in Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not be afraid. What could man do to me? The Lord is on my side. I will not be afraid. Isaiah 41, 10, do not fear. I am with you. Do not be afraid. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will surely help you. I will uphold you with my right hand of righteousness. Just hang on. God is for us, he's saying. No one can stand in his way. He says in verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
God did not withhold his son from the anguish and the humiliation and the death. Instead, God yielded him. He did not hold back. He, according to verse 32, he delivered him up. He surrendered. That word delivered means to surrender or yield. He, he delivered him up to custody so that he'd be judged, condemned, punished, scourged, tormented, and finally put to death. He delivered him up. So how shall he not with him also free, freely give us all things? You see, with him we receive all things that he freely and graciously gives. In Ephesians 1, 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Peter said in 2 Peter 1, verse 3, According as his, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. What am I lack? What am I lacking? Am I lacking anything? The Bible says, no, you have all things. God is giving you all that is necessary. And again, sometimes we say if we only add a little more. A little more what? A little more what? No, he's already given us all things in Christ. What we need to do is we need to learn how to just exercise those things that he's given to us. It's like that lady who had, her son had been in the military for many years, and he finally got out. He hadn't been home. He got out, and he went to his mom's house, and as he went to the house, he, he goes through the picket fence there, and the, and the, the door was off, the, 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 the gate was off its hinge, and, and he walks in, and he sees the grass has died, and it, Weeds and plants and the screen door is, is, the screen is rusted and peeling out. He enters into the house and it's dingy and, Mama, what happened? What do you mean what happened? I don't have any money. This is what happens when you have no money. So what are you talking about? I said, Mama, I, I've been sending you money orders for the last several years. To support you. She has money orders. What's that? Money orders. You don't know what a money... Mom, I... No, what's that? He said, I've been... Oh, you mean those pieces of paper? He goes, what are you talking about? She says, come here. She, he walks into one of the rooms, and she had wallpapered the room with money orders. She wallpapered the room with the money orders, with, his, with the money that he had sent her. God has given to us access to his blessings and we put them on the wall we kind of look at them every once in a while paul is saying that isn't what it's for god has given you these blessings and you come behind in no gift exercise those things understand those things you've been justified he sees you as glorified if he's for you who can be against you so live as the one who is victorious not the one who is wondering how this is going to end. And so, who can condemn the one that God has declared to be not guilty? In 1 John 2, Paul said it like this, or rather John said it. He said in verse 1, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he asks, in verse 34, and I'll read to verse 39 and synopsize that. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness, peril, sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we're, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so who can, verse 33, I, I jumped over that, but who can bring a charge against God's elect? We know that Satan accuses us. We know our heart can accuse us. But God has already forgiven us. Who is the one who can condemn the one that God has declared to be not guilty? No one. And so Jesus is the one, verse 34, who makes intercession for us. And then the question is asked, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Who and what can separate us from the love that Christ has for us? Hmm. Who can do that? Who can come between Christ and his bride? Who can take the love of Christ, the love he has for me, who can take that away from me? Who's able to do that? Who can separate me and my, my master? Who can separate us from the love that Christ Jesus has for us? And, and now he begins to speak about the things that, that people would say, well, I used to love Jesus, but this happened. So he, he speaks about tribulation. Can tribulation... Tribulation speaks of intense pressure. Can distress? The word distress speaks of somebody who is hemmed in and helpless. Can persecution? When people revile you to your face or physically attack you or speak evil of you, can that separate you from Christ's love for you? No. Can, can famine? Famine results very often from persecution. Can famine separate me from the love of Christ? No. Can nakedness? destitution or poverty no can peril danger in general no can the sword can can someone uh, attempt to take my life and thus make Jesus no longer love me and he's saying no in verse 36 he says it like this and he's actually quoting a psalm psalm 44 verse 22 he says for your sake we're killed all day long we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter as believers we're exposed to danger and we're, we're exposed to to, to the potential for death constantly, yet, verse 37, and all of these things were more than conquerors. In and through all of these things, we remain overwhelmingly victorious. So instead of losing hope, we can come out of trouble stronger than ever before. Because he said, I'm persuaded that nothing can separate me. Nothing in existence can separate me. And of this he's saying, I'm persuaded. He is saying, I am thoroughly convinced. Death is nothing I fear because it's been defeated by Jesus. Life with all its tribulation and trials cannot separate me. Angels, whether good or fallen, cannot. Principalities, it speaks of the government of angels, including the fallen angels. Things present, things to come. Everything we ever experience, including all disasters, powers, which speak of governmental authority, but also demonic, the height or the depth. The fact is, and this will close with this thought, the love of Christ covers everything from the beginning to the end of our relationship with him. Nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. When you leave tonight, please if anything sticks with you, may that stick with you. Nothing can separate you from his love. His love is everlasting. Everlasting. And you can feel bad, yes, and you can feel so many different things. If your heart condemns you, and it can, God is greater than your heart. He knows all things. The enemy would like to whisper in your, your ear, and I know some of you know what I'm saying when I say this. He would like to whisper in your ear, and he does it in a variety of ways. You're gone too far. He can't possibly love you. Look at you. Look at you. <coughs> You've gone too far. I was in Ensenada, 1973, Cinco de Mayo weekend. I was drunk for two days. Two friends and I had polished off two cases of beer between Newport Beach and the border, Tijuana. And then for two days, I backslid and drank myself into oblivion for two days. I was an alcoholic before I got saved. Alcohol was a very tempting thing for me. And so we went crazy for two days and yet I was there on the street and somebody handed me a track actually I found it on the ground it was in Spanish but I knew it was a Bible track and I handed it to somebody 
for them to read. And the guy said something very vulgar to me as I handed it to him. But it was that reaction that made me think, what am I doing? I'm not... You know, pigs will go back to the, to the mud that they've been washed from. Dogs do return to their vomit. But a son of God or daughter of God doesn't. You may, you may be tempted to and maybe even start splashing around a little bit, but that isn't, you don't go back. Why? Because um, a pig is a pig and a dog is a dog and you're neither a pig nor a dog. You're a child of the king. And the Lord has a way of reminding you. And it was through his mercy and his compassion. And I came home and my, my sister Madeline said, oh, you were gone for three days. Did you have a good time? And that, I said, yeah, I had a blast. We did this, we did that. And I started crying. I still remember I was there at the kitchen table with my sister Madeline, and I wept, and I said, I've walked away from Jesus, and i got to come home. I can't do this. I went to church that night, and the, uh, the evangelist that was at the church gave an invitation. If you backslidden, he said, stand and get right with God. And I stood there with all these other people. I still remember it. I stood up, and I said, I'm not going back. I'm going to follow Jesus. That was May. And a couple months later, I, I uh, enrolled at Biola University. It was called Biola College at that time. I became a Bible major and a history major and then a psychology major. But, and I, I didn't turn back. Because if God is for you, who can be against you? Because what shall separate you from the love of Christ? Shall your sin? No. He loves you, and he gives you hope, and he forgives you. And all you need to do is say, God, be merciful to me. I am so sorry. I haven't been what I should be. The enemy says he doesn't love you, but Paul says, oh, yes, he does, with an everlasting love. He laid his life down for us. God didn't spare his own son. How shall he not with him give us all things that pertain to life? Keep that in mind because your God loves you. And some of you think he doesn't. Well, let me remind you today, he does. Father, we ask.